I've got to tell you that it was unbelievable the results from that hunt. Every parent that attended wanted to sign up for the Huntmaster class to be able to go on future events um, and participate in it. And then the next step is providing those individuals the knowledge and the resources and the public access information so they can continue to take their youth and be successful in the future. So that family bonding to me is the most critical step in the process. If we can teach and engage that parent or guardian, then they will continue taking that youth in the future. So as you can see, we're really excited about our upcoming SCTP season and the expansion of our youth hunting and fishing program and your continued support is critical to the success of these programs. So I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Director Carter. Chairman Ken, if you wouldn't mind joining me, we have just a small token of a certificate of achievement to some of the SCTP participants, and I think it would be fitting if you presented those. Okay, who's Caitlin? Where could Ka oh, there she is. <laughs> Ms. Caitlin, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency congratulates you in recognition of your efforts for achieving the title of National Champion Bunker Trap with your, with your team into dust i really want to hear this one the into dust story how you came up with that name shotgun club of knox county during the 2016 sctp national championships miss caitlin congratulations Come on up. Zachary Maggard, in recognition of his efforts for achieving the title of National Champion Bunker Trap with his team Into Dust Shotgun Club of Knox County during the 2016 SCTP National Championships. Congratulations, sir. Come on up here. Let's get Zach, at some point in time, I would love to hear your story as well uh, to you both. I fully expect, this is my challenge of you, and it may not have to do anything with busting clays, but it's a challenge and it's achievable. Uh, my money is on both of you being up at this table at some point in the future. And Caitlin, specifically for you, you've got two women serving on this commission that are remarkable role models. I encourage you to follow them and watch them. And uh, again, I'm looking forward to the, I hope I live uh, to see the day where you all are up here. So thanks for all that you have done and how you've represented this state. We'll continue with the agenda. Wildlife Management Committee, uh, Kurt Holbert, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Wildlife Management Committee would like to call on Director Ed Carter. Thank you, Commissioner. Take just one second to back up on the agenda. My granddaughter taught sought SCTP on her high school team, and uh, she's out at UT here in the wildlife curriculum. And she came home last year for her first after her first quarter. She said, "Is my gun out in the garage?" I said, "Well, yeah." She said, "I got to go. I got to shoot something." I did, she said, "I am so stressed out." <laughs> So she did, and, she, and she's back to normal. So I just want to say there's all kinds of benefits to, to being a part of this program, but, and we're glad to help support part of that. But the other program coming up is about the Appalachian Bear Rescue. 
uh, when I graduated from high school, my mother grew up in Wallen, Tennessee, which is, they like to say, the gateway to Townsend. <laughs> so anyway, she, she grew up there, and we moved back there after I graduated from high school and lived there, and there was a place called Laurel Lake very close to there that we would go there, and, and it's a, it was a small lake, and over the years it's really become not a lake anymore, but what has become is the Appalachian Bear Rescue was located in that same area. And the Appalachian Bear Rescue is just that. It, it, it takes orphan cubs and tries to bring those back to a status where they can be re-released in the wild with as least or no human interaction so that they're never imprinted on humans or never get used to that side of the, the equation. They get support from our agency, but not much in the way financial, almost none actually. But at the same time, they have a great service that they provide to the people of Tennessee and also to our agency. As you well know, bears are, are a very iconic symbol, especially in the Smoky Mountain area. And without their help and help in their expertise in doing what they do, it would be a huge program that we would have to saddle up to in some way. And right now we don't because we have those people at the Appalachian Bear Rescue to do that for us. So they've, they've done remarkable work. They do research work as well. So there's a lot of interaction that goes on between the agency and the ABR. Dana Dodd is serving as president and CEO of the Appalachian Bear Rescue. It is a volunteer position that she's in. She actually lives in Nashville. We talk occasionally, occasionally we get together for lunch or she'll come by the office and we kind of catch up on where we need to be. But she, while we were in the Knoxville area, uh, it was fitting that, that they have the time on the agenda to come over and explain some of the things that they're doing at ABR and the services they provide and the interaction between the agencies. So Dana, if you would please. I'm assuming you're coming over here. And just so you know, the rule hearing does not apply to you. It's up on the screen, but we'll do that later. But thank you, Dana, for being here. Thank you very much. Let me offer one word before Dana begins to speak. Uh, Walter Cook took me up to ABR truly when I first got on the commission. And they were doing remarkable work then. Uh, I guess it was a couple of years later, uh, Dana uh, was in charge, uh, became in charge of ABR. And I still remember Coach Fulmer's words when he first took on the head coaching position. His goal was to take it to the next level. Uh, it is fun to be able to say and fun to have the, presenter, uh, the uh, presentation being done by Dana. Dana has taken ABR to the next level. We've got a lot to be proud of. We've got a great partner. So thank you for all your work, ma'am. You've done a phenomenal thank job. Thank you. I do very little in comparison to all of our volunteers, all of our volunteer board members, our staff. We, we do a whole lot with black bears in Tennessee and maybe some things that you don't even know. But uh, this past summer in July, we celebrated our 20th year of taking care of injured and orphaned bear cubs, mostly from Tennessee, though we have taken cubs from eight different states and the National Park Service. And over those 20 years, we've taken care of 257 bears. I think something that is a little astounding, it certainly is to me, but, and I know it is to our curators, is that in the last 18 months, because of a hard mast failure in East Tennessee last year, 56, or more than 20% of our 20-year total, 56 cubs came through our gates. And along with those came 56 or more officers. I don't know how you guys get to all of those bear cubs. I don't know how you answer all the phones. But when there is a mast failure, that's just what's going to happen. And in about maybe a couple weeks or maybe even less, for the first time since April the 4th of 2015, we will be cubless at ABR. And I guess used to, years ago, that used to kind of scare me a little bit. But really, I've learned that that's when the real work starts. Because you can't repair facilities, you can't expand facilities, you can't have guests, you can't do any of those things until you finally don't have cubs. And I know that our curator staff, we've, we've been between three and five 
off and on in the last year to take care of all these bears because we do do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So they've rotated through, and I know that they are looking forward to a break. Officer Gene Parker back there, we saw him a few hundred times, it seems like, last fall and, in the, and through the winter. And uh, Gene was just telling me that if we had another mast failure this year, he didn't know that he was going to survive, and he wasn't sure that we would either. And we are in total agreement. Most everyone here, I'm sure, knows that we take care of injured and orphaned bear cubs. But what you may not know is that we also do some research about our bears in Tennessee. And Caitlin, if you decide to pursue a career, a college career in biology, be certain that you let us know when you're done because we have curator positions and we need biologists who can carry on the research and can make sure that we take care of these cubs in a professional way that get them back out to the wild. So remember Appalachian Bear Rescue. But Coy Blair is our head curator. He's back in the back there. And Coy, we have, uh, we're paying for his master's degree at the University of Tennessee. A lot of people don't know, and Coy's pretty quiet, but uh, he was a 4.0 student at Maryville College with a degree, undergraduate degree in biology. And so far, he's a 4.0 student in graduate school at UT in wildlife and fisheries. So of those 56 bear cubs that left ABR in the last 18 months, 40 of them left with GPS tracking collars around their necks. And Coy is gathering data from those collars. We've already sent a number of them back to Germany and had them refurbished. And the next cubs that leave will have those collars as well. And we want to learn about how well our, or not our program works. And we need data to do that. So we have invested well over $100,000 in those GPS tracking collars. And by the time you count uh, education at UT and all the other time that we have paid for, we'll have about $150,000 or more dollars invested in the Black Bears of Tennessee and understanding how well rehabilitation and release of cubs work. So... We're, we're going to continue that kind of research effort. And one of the ways we're doing that is we have permission to keep some of the female cubs that we've released. We're going to visit them in their dens this winter, we hope. And we're going to replace those collars on them with a new collar that will last another year. We want to know if these females make it to reproductive age and do they produce cubs of their own. Because in the end, that's where science meets the road. And that's what those bear cubs were put here to do, to reproduce, to make more, and to keep black bear cubs and black bears thriving in East Tennessee and across the plateau. And in the last week, we have finally, we've been talking about this with UT, we've been talking about it with TWRA, Dan Gibbs, We've been talking about it with Bill Stiver at the National Park Service. Years ago, all of those organizations worked with us, and we had a very successful fostering program because when you get the little cub who still has to be bottle-fed and still has to be handled more than we would ever like to have to handle them, when you get those cubs, oftentimes mothers are still in dens. And if you have some sows collared and you've done your den studies, when those little cubs arrive, you can foster those bears out to mothers in a den. We know 20 years ago that it worked really, really well. And for whatever reason, we haven't pursued that very much in the last 20 years. But we have permission and we have given collars to the National Park Service and they are deciding which females will be collared and next spring, if we receive the call in March or early April, those little cubs will have so much, uh, so much better chance of success because as good as we can ever be, we will never, ever compare to a mother bear. So we want to continue all of that research, and all of our resources are always available to your agencies. 
and, and to the National Park Service and to UT to make sure that we lead with any bear research, not just in research for the cubs that come through our facility. Next, we promote public awareness about living safely with black bears. And I know you've all seen it, maybe not as much this summer as the summer before, but bears getting into all sorts of trouble. There's nothing a bear won't do if he thinks something it might be food. And so we talk to people, young and old. We explain to them how to live safely with our bears. And we work very hard every day to be a good steward in our area. We have a volunteer group that does nothing but pick up trash in Townsend, Tennessee to make sure that the bears don't get into the trash. And so many of our trash cans in Townsend are right down by a four-lane highway on the river. And so we also prevent, I hope, accidents on 321 with people hitting bears because that's very dangerous to the bear and to people and to our insurance agencies and everybody else who has to pay for that kind of damage. So we try to take care of Townsend, and we've reached out. We're part of the Gatlinburg Bearwise Task Force. One of our board members is on that task force as well with your leaders. And we're going to continue to do those things as often and as loudly and with as much energy as, as we can possibly do it. So bears, they're a big business in East Tennessee, and they're going to be nothing but bigger. I remember as a kid, the only thing I wanted to know when we came to the National Park was, are we going to see a bear and when? And you don't have to be stuck in Cave Cove in a bear jam more than once to know that tourism and bears are a big, big deal. And we want to make sure that we are supporting the black bears of Tennessee. So as we finish our 2016 Cub season, finally, in the next few weeks, we will have grown to be a half million dollar business here in East Tennessee. We'll also log 12,000 volunteer hours and all of the resources we have financially and all of those volunteer hours are devoted strictly to the bears of East Tennessee, nothing else. We have 193,000 Facebook fans. They ask us questions, they learn about black bears, they learn a respect for black bears, and yes, they love bears by names, and they love them, and maybe think of them a little differently than some of us do. But they appreciate what you're doing, and what we're doing, and what we can all do together for the bears here, and for the bears everywhere else that they exist, either in Tennessee or here in, in the United States. I recently read a study. Um, if you know John Beecham, he uh, was one of you for a long time in Idaho. He was a wildlife officer. He has since retired from that, and he has done probably more research on release of captive reared bear cubs back into the wild than anyone else. And there's a lot of scientific stuff about bears that I don't understand, and I have to ask Coy. But there's a sentence that he's put in several of his studies, and I found it very interesting for what I do. John said, developing programs for the release of captive reared bears can have direct and indirect conservation implications that extend beyond obvious welfare benefits such as increasing public support and participation in conservation projects. And I think he couldn't be further from, uh, he, he is absolutely right on target with that because we have, we've developed a very unique voice. We speak to a group of people who are very interested in conservation and in wildlife Perhaps they're not as interested in hunting. Some are and some are not. But we bring them to, a ta to our table, and they not only support our mission, but indirectly and sometimes directly, they support your mission in helping the bears in Tennessee. And they do that from all around the world. So in the next few weeks, 
we're going to be cubless for the first time since April 4th of 2015. And once we're cubless, I invite all of you, I expect you to make my phone ring. Come to Appalachian Bear Rescue and see what we do. See how we do it. We'll take you through the dens and all the pens and the acclimation pens and the nursery. We'll show you how we gather blackberries and blueberries and muscadines with our volunteers and we have those stored for next year's cubs. We'll show you all the stuff that we do because we want you to know not only that we do it, but how we do it. And we want you to talk to our curator staff, to Curator Coy Blair, to Janet Dalton, to Tom Faulkner. We want you to understand what they do and how hard they work not to have any contact with these bears so that they can successfully release them back to the wild. So please come and see us. We invite all the TWRA officers, particularly any who have bears in your county, Whatever you may remember from Appalachian Bear Rescue five or ten years ago, whatever you may think that Appalachian Bear Rescue is all about, come back to see us, come back to learn what we do, and any time that we can help you or that we can bring any resource to bear, whether that's people or money or effort, whatever it might be, be sure to ask because we're always there and we're really only there to help you and to help bears. Any questions? That was pretty easy. Thank you very much. Thank you.